the chili pepper. What is there not to love about it? Well... Tough? Yeah. As much pain as I've been in in a while. Yeah. Wow. Yet we still consume the chili pepper at insane rates. They are ubiquitous in Indian, East and Southeast Asian, African, Caribbean, and European cuisine today. While everyone cannot hang with some of the heat levels, everyone has had that soothing feeling of relaxation after a spicy hit of chili peppers. Some of us are even crazy enough to continue going back again and again for more dances with the hot pepper. Why is it so deviously delicious to eat something that causes our eyes to cry, nose to run, and mouths to burn like the seventh circle of hell? Yet, we still eat these beautiful botanical gifts and push the boundaries of crossbreeding and creation. With this very year, a new pepper clocked at over 2.69 million Scoville heat units. The heat continues in popular culture today, with one of the most prolific YouTube shows, Hot Ones, having every popular guest you can think of under the sun. It's an interview with beloved celebrities and public figures who are sweated out under the lights by the magic of the spice. With worldwide production in 2020 at 36 million tons of chili peppers, 46% of which were produced in China alone. It's hard to imagine most worldwide cuisines today lacking the spice delivered by the chili pepper. But before the 16th century, they were entirely without it. The food was one exclusive to the Americas. We ask in this state of global pepper domination, where, why, and how did the dazzling chili pepper conquer the world? Food historian's best guess from the body of evidence points to Bolivia and Western South America as the birthplace of the chili pepper up in the Eastern mountains. Wild chilies at oldest being dated to 7,500 BC in Bolivia and recordings of full domestication in Mexico by 4,100 BC. Capsaicin, the active ingredient in the pepper that triggers the pain response in our body, is a chemical irritant and mild neurotoxin for almost all animals, except for one, birds. The theory goes that birds on migration between Mexico and South America brought the wild chili peppers across the continent and early Mesoamerican societies began domesticating them. So that begs the question, how did Europeans get their hands on them? And why is this called pepper, as well as this is called pepper? Thankfully, we do have a scapegoat for why these two entirely unrelated plants have the same name. And it's almost like this man is responsible for something else being misnamed too. Columbus's primary goals for his voyage were many, but after gold, god, and land, Perhaps the most important impetus was that of the black pepper trade. Ferdinand and Isabella, the sovereigns of Castile and Aragon, were the ones responsible for financing Columbus. They had hoped for many things, and pepper was definitely on the top of their list. As the price for black pepper skyrocketed, and trade with India became more difficult due to Ottoman dominance of trade routes, Ferdinand and Isabella decided to greenlight Columbus's voyage. Black pepper is completely unrelated to chili peppers, botanically speaking, but both being spicy and the first-hand accounts of and the economic need for Columbus to claim that he found pepper is what fueled the etymological overlap between these two spices. To quote from Richard Sveed's Hot Peppers, The Story of Cajuns and Capsaicum, we get some great quotes and summaries of the very first written accounts of Europeans coming across the chili pepper. Quote, since Columbus did not turn up so much as one grain of black pepper from the Americas, he was quick to promote the potential monetary gains of the hot peppers that he had found growing in such abundance. He wrote enthusiastically of them in his journal entry for January 15, 1493. The land was found to produce much ahi, which is the pepper of the inhabitants, and more valuable than the common sort, they deem it to be very wholesome and eat nothing without it. Fifty caravels might be loaded every year with this commodity. Columbus also directly quotes the newfound pepper as being superior to the black peppercorns of the East, quoted as saying, the spicery that they eat, says the Admiral, is abundant and more valuable than black pepper or grains of the paradise. He left a recommendation to those whom traveled there, that they should get as much as they could. 
But what is understanding history if we leave it as a boiled down economic trend, seeing human experience simply as the harvesting of resources and the transmutation of taste and nutrition into a sales pitch by a questionable figure looking for funding for a second voyage? What's more pressing is answering the question, was the chili pepper an instant classic to the Europeans? That's what I'm really interested in. Thankfully, we have a first-hand account, which just in the past few years has begun to be fully translated into English for the public. Gonzalo Fernandez de Aviado y Valdez, often referred to simply as Oviedo, was born in Madrid in 1478. He grew up in Ferdinand and Isabella's court as a page to their son. To modern-day historians, Oviedo's main place stands as a writer who was a contemporaneous enemy to Bartolomeu de las Casas, a Dominican friar who traveled to New Spain as a missionary. Las Casas wrote extensively on the atrocities committed by conquistadors against the Native Americans and spent his life fighting for the rights of natives and decrying the actions of the conquistadors like Hernán Cortés and the encomienda system as a whole. But this was only after personally benefiting from and taking part in the conquistadors' actions against the natives. Las Casas was eventually given the first title and office of Protector of the Indians by the Regent King of Castile, and today is seen as a great Spanish historian and social reformer. In contrast, Oviedo arrived in the Indies in 1514 at age 36 to work as a mining inspector at Castilla del Oro on the Isthmus of Panama. He was captivated by America's natural world and he aspired to write about its history. The place that I want to highlight about Oviedo's writings comes not from his history of the people of the Americas, which is fascinating in its own right, but rather the dives he takes into gastronomy critiques. Oviedo might very well be the first recorded food critic of these new foods in the Americas that would soon take over the world. In his Natural History of the West Indies, published in 1526, he details his first-hand accounts with the geography, flora, and cuisine that he came across during his trips to the Americas. Of interest, he describes the taste and ubiquity of every possible plant and animal that he could get his hands on, and wasn't afraid of sharing his opinion. Oviedo tried the armadillo, anteater, crocodile, and he took a particular liking to the pineapple as well as the iguana. And I find his quip of the iguana to be of note. Quote, This animal, as ugly and horrific as I had described it, is a very good delicacy and better than the very good rabbits from the banks of the Harama River in Spain. I mention these rabbits because I think that they are the best in the whole world. Ever since the Christians dared to eat these animals, they have been well regarded among them. Oviedo also gives some of the oldest insights to the etymology origins of the word Caribbean, which just so happens to be related to the chili pepper. Quote, I believe that carib more accurately means strong or brave on that coast or part of the mainland, and even on these islands, because when one eats peppers and they burn a lot, or sips a soup that is burning a lot, one says it is very carib. How we first learn that the chili pepper is a mainstay of the native diet is from Oviedo's writings. Oviedo gives an overview as well as his own opinions about the pepper, dedicating a whole chapter of his natural history of the West Indies to chronicling the chili pepper in great detail. Now to show that I have a bit of skin in the game myself, I'd like to share my personal experience with the Scotch bonnet pepper, which is between 250,000 and 350,000 Scoville heat units, clocking in at about 50 to 75 times as hot as a jalapeno. Enjoy watching me struggle with the heat while I read Oviedo's Chronicle of the Chili Pepper, or Ahi, as they're called by the Taino people. Quote, Ahi is a well-known and much-used plant all throughout these Indies, islands, and mainland. It is quite useful and necessary because its spice quality gives a very good and appealing flavor to other foods, like fish and meat. It is the Indian's pepper, and though it is quite abundant, they grow it diligently and carefully in their gardens and farms because they eat it constantly with fish and with most of their foods. It is just as agreeable to the Christians, who think no less of it, for in addition to being a good spice, it has a pleasant warming quality in the stomach, and it is healthy, but really quite hot. The plant tends to grow to be about waist high, but some varieties can grow higher than a very tall man. The height has a lot to do with the fertility and irrigation of the soil, but most often the ahi is five or six spans high, 
maybe a little more or less, with many branches sprouting from the stem. The flower is small, white, and odorless. While the fruits can vary in appearance and color, almost all are quite hot, much like peppercorns and some even more. The plant bears seeds, or rather fruit pods, that are hollow and of a very fine red color. Some grow to the length and thickness of a finger. Other varieties grow pods that are about as round and fat as a cherry, more or less. Another variety bears green pods, but smaller than the red ones. And in that way, according to the variety and the soil in which it is planted, they can go smaller or larger, red or green, since they don't wait for them to ripen. Some bear tiny green pods, and others have black spotted pods that tend toward a dark blue. There is one variety that is not hot and can even be eaten raw. The leaves can be made into a sauce that is just as good, if not better, than a sauce made from parsley. Although, one sauce is hot and the other is not. The truth is that the ahi goes better with meat and fish than very fine black pepper. It is brought to Spain, Italy, and other places, as it is a very good spice and a healthy food, and whenever men come across it, they like it very much. Merchants send for it from Europe and seek it out diligently for their own appetites and enjoyments, for they have seen that it is a very healthy food, especially in the winter and cold weather. And although some may claim it's mild, it seems to me that the ahi is quite hot. Now I find it very comforting to know that our ancestors were getting just as sweated out by, surprised, and inspired by the ahi as I am today. Now today we associate potatoes with Ireland, tomatoes with Italy, and just spicy food and chili peppers with several Asian nations. But none of these modern day staples that we see the world with were even possible to be an idea in the minds of the culinary forefathers of these countries until the Afro-Eurasian groups were introduced to the foods of the Americas, including, and not limited to, our hot peppers. <laughs>